The following is a production of the University of Minnesota, driven to discover. Hi, David Arendale here, your host for PAL Groups. Thanks for joining us again. We feature an interview with Nikila, who is one of the University of Minnesota students who serves as a PAL facilitator for a college algebra course. Among the many things that we end up covering in the interview, listen for these four individual items which I thought were particularly interesting. One, she ends up discussing the, rate, the nature of using gaming inside of PAL sessions and whether it works better in maybe perhaps some sessions in some subject areas versus others. Another issue is uh, her talking about how she gets the students to take more responsibility for the board work and the way that the students end up helping to conduct the sessions. The third item is her reason for choosing groups of size of three for small group activities. I thought that was particularly interesting. And then the final item is, is talking about on how she asked students to provide alternative solutions for the problems and why that would be particularly helpful for student learning. So let's go ahead and listen to the interview. Well, greetings, everyone. Get an opportunity to visit with another student. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Nikita Kataria. This is my third year at the U. My major is biomedical engineering. Well, tell us a little bit about the class that you're uh, serving as a facilitator in. The class is Math 1031. It's college algebra. Basically, like it's students who are behind in math a little bit because they didn't do it in high school, and so they just take this class at the U, and then they can move on to Calculus 1 or Pre-Calc or whatever they need to. What is it that you think makes um, an algebra course the most challenging then? I think that a lot of students who come in haven't quite done math in a few years or like they're coming back to school after a few years and so they just need to like brush up on everything. I mean, I don't think the concepts are very hard. I think it's just that a lot of people don't do math for a while and then so they think it's really hard. So it's just kind of their math skills atrophy. It's not that they can't do it. Right, it's exactly, that's exactly it. Like it's not that they can't like do the work. They can, they can do it. It's just like it's been a while so they don't have confidence. So part of the issue is confidence as well as their skills being rusty. Right. I mean, the main part, I think, in my class is mostly just like encouraging them to like actually do the work and show them that they do know what they're talking about, which I think is really important. Well, talk to us about some of the strategies and activities you do inside of your PAL sessions that seem to meet the need and describe them a little bit and also try to share why do you think that they work so well? So most of my PAL sessions are pretty much formatted in the same way. Both of my sessions don't really like games. And, and that's, you know, that's fine. Now, that's a good point because some of the facilitators you'll hear on the podcast end up using competitive games. They're good for motivation. But why do you think that the competitive things don't work as well in your sessions? I think that they're more just focused on, like, understanding. And they, don't, and they feel like they don't, like, quite learn as much because they're rushed during a competitive game to understand and get the answer without, like, really understanding what's going on. I personally feel that games are not very helpful because they do put an element of rushing and then they don't focus as much on doing the work and understanding what's going on and how you can apply the work you're doing in a certain problem to everything else you're doing. Okay, well describe a couple of activities that you do. You said you do some things often. Which ones do you do the most? The one thing that I do every session is I put problems on the board and then uh, I have I give them like 15 minutes to do them. I put up four problems and then they have 15 minutes to do them and then they come up to the board and show their work and then uh, someone else comes and explains the work or they explain it and if like it doesn't make sense then I'll go up to the board and I'll explain it but that's kind of like a last resort. So they work in small groups then? They work in groups of three, sometimes four if like a lot of people show up. Any reason why you choose three or four is the group size? It, I think it works really well in threes. I think that's like you can talk without getting distracted and that's enough people working on a problem, but I think if it goes more than that, sometimes I think four is a little too much and okay. people get off topic, but I think that I've just realized over time that three is a good number to go with. Okay. Is there any other activities that go along with that? Do you have them explain the process of solving the problem or key vocabulary terms or anything like that? The one thing that I do do is I have people put up alternative solutions to a problem. So if like someone did something one way and then I ask people, did you do this another way or did you do it in this way that you talked about in class? 
And then I have that person come up and like write another solution so people can see like two different ways of doing something and which one works best for them mentally to comprehend what's going on. Because I think that if you see multiple solutions, it's easier to see how like understanding what's going on on a basic level will help you understand other problems too that are not just like verbatim, you know, from one type of problem. Well, that's really good. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and finish up with our last question, which is, what are you getting out of this experience, uh, personally or professionally, being a panel facilitator? I really, like, enjoy it. I enjoy teaching. And I've realized through, like, doing PAL that I really enjoy helping students. And it, that I like that interaction. And I like that I have to learn to be patient and not just give the answer away. And I think those are important skills to, like, learn patience. Show people the way without really showing them the way. I think that's, like, kind of a hard skill to manage, to, like, help someone get an answer without really giving them the answer. And I think... I've also learned interaction, like being friendly and open is a really big part of people coming to you and talking to you about problems that they're having. So I think that's really important. Uh, well, I'm pre-med, so I'm going to apply to medical school after college. So I definitely think that it's it's like skills that I'm learning now, which are really helpful. Like interaction is really good with people learning how to be friendly, learning how to communicate well, learning to be patient. I think those things are really important for me in the future, too. So I'm learning them now, which is good. Well, thank you very much, and I hope all of our listeners can pick up a couple of good ideas from you as well. So thanks for coming in. Well, thanks for listening to this episode. More information about PAL is available at the website palgroups.org, P-A-L-G-R-O-U-P-S dot O-R-G. Join us next time for another interview about peer-assisted learning. Until then, take good care and good listening.